Hello, everyone that just joined. We have some questions about the discussion box. So how it's going to work is everyone is muted if you're a participant and not a panelist. And this was just to ensure the maximum privacy during our session today. Um, but if you do have a question or a comment or anything you'd like to share, please don't hesitate to pop it into the chat um, box or you're welcome to email it to me directly as well. Um, my email was shared in your registration information. So to keep us on time tonight, we're going to begin. Um, so thank you to everyone for joining us and welcome to our Region 11 forum on the opioid crisis. We're so glad that you're able to join us tonight. Um, and just so that you do know the session is being recorded so we can share it with fellow RNAO members and non-members after the event. So my name is Lil Bresson and I'm the Region 11 representative for RNAO. Um, I represent the chapters of Algoma, Sudbury and District, Nipissing, Kirkland Lake, Temiskaming and Porcupine. Um, and I'm grateful to be emceeing on their behalf and all of the presidents that put this event together tonight. So a special thank you goes out to these chapters. For those of you who are non-members, um, we're just getting to know RNAO. RNAO is the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario that represents nurses, as well as advocates for healthy public policy, excellence in nursing, and increased contribution by nurses to shaping the healthcare system and the decisions that affect the public that we serve as nurses. So in the midst of COVID and the many challenges that we are facing, it is important that we don't forget the various layers of challenges um, and public health crises that our communities are facing with the opioid crisis and unintentional opioid deaths being one of those. Um, so we can't begin to thank you again for joining us and to our speakers who were kind enough to log back in tonight to share their expertise and information. We definitely do appreciate it. Um, and so to begin our forum, we have our three goals, which are to connect as nurses and community members, to educate on the, opioid, on the opioid crisis and the strategy that is in place, as well as current efforts across different organizations, as well as to act. So to spark some ideas of what we could be doing as nurses and in our communities to uh, really address this problem. And as you know, this forum was intended to be during Nurses Week. So we do wanna wish everyone a very happy Nurses Week. We hope you did enjoy your special week as well as are enjoying and celebrating the year of the nurse and midwife. So this topic was selected by our membership. We had a survey that went out earlier this year and it was identified as a hot topic of interest by members. It was a priority issue selected by RNAO and was a highlight topic during our Queen's Park Day this year where we're 300 nurses and nursing students gathered to address the government um, based on some priority issues with the opioid crisis being one. As I mentioned, this is a big public health crisis and RNAO really believes this demands a practical approach that focuses on harm reduction. So to date, RNAO has done several things and initiatives to help address this issue, uh, including taking part in the hearing before the Supreme Court for Vancouver Safe Injection Site, uh, urging the province to respond to the crisis and to fund safe injection sites, as well as additional services. Um, we published a best practice guideline on implementing supervised injection sites, and RNAO continues to advocate for the people who use substances and the health services that they need. So our agenda tonight is going to look like the following. We're going to have an introduction to the opioid crisis, followed by a 10 minute presentation on education and prevention, treatment, harm reduction and enforcement um, before our question period begins and some closing remarks. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Bridget. Hi. Sorry. Um, so Bridget is a research and policy analyst at the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction. Her work focuses on examining trends in substance use and related harms, including the identification of new and emerging threats. Bridget also recently co-authored a publication titled Lessons Learned from the Opioid Crisis Across the Pillars of the Canadian Drugs and Substances Strategy. We're grateful to have her with us here tonight to share an introduction to the opioid crisis as well as the strategy, which will frame the remaining components of our discussion. So Bridget, it's all yours. Great, thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for having me and giving me the opportunity to speak to you all. I'm going to try and keep my comments uh, quite brief because I think uh, the next speakers will have a lot of interesting things. So do feel free to ask me any questions in the, in the chat function and I'll stick around until the end also to, to answer your questions. Uh, so the next slide. And sorry, Lila, I gave you a lot of slides to click through. Um, so just quickly, uh, my organization, the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction, uh, we are a national nonprofit organization um, with a mandate to address uh, problematic substance use. Oh, sorry, I hear them cutting off. Um, 
that any better? Maybe I speak a little slower. Maybe I'll, I'll keep going, but let me know if this if it's an issue. Uh, so maybe next slide. Uh, so I, I won't do all this, but this is just to flag some resources that I thought you all might find helpful on um, that that we have on our website, both on opioids as well as COVID and its impact on substance use. Uh, and then the final bullet there is just uh, we we host an early warning system where we where we submit alerts and bulletins on new and emerging drug use issues. Uh, you can subscribe to that if you find it helpful. Uh, okay, you can keep going. So um, the opioid crisis is ongoing in Ontario and in Canada. I, I won't dwell on the stats for too long because I think we are all uh, unfortunately all too well aware of, of what's happening. Uh, but I just wanted to flag that uh, opioid related harms have been increasing for a number of years. You can see in this graph, this is uh, opioid related harms um, in Ontario back from 2003 all the way to 2018. And you can see that it's around 2015 or 2016 that those harms really started to increase. So that, that top chart is um, is emergency department visits and then the second line is hospitalizations followed by death. Uh, next slide. So the reasons for these increases, looks like it's not just one reason, but uh, the, the impact of fentanyl really can't be overstated. Uh, so in 2014, we really started to increase in fentanyl in the illicit drug market. Um, so for example, we released a number in 2014 that um, were some oxycodone tablets, or these that were sugar pills in fentanyl. Um, and this has really increased uh, over 70% so of deaths in Ontario related to opioids, uh, included fentanyl in that. Um, and that really just speaks to the fact that if you don't know what substance you're consuming, it's very difficult to do it safely, which is why um, our, our drug strategy is so important. Um, so I'll, I'll keep moving along. I think maybe some people are having trouble hearing me, but um, but hopefully enough is written on my slide. You can get, you can get enough information. So the, the fourth pillar strategy, uh, for the first pillar is prevention. So that's uh, the idea of preventing problematic drugs and use in the first place. Um, so that's through education uh, policy and, and ensuring that people have resources that they need. Uh, next slide. The second pillar is treatment, so that's uh, ensuring that people have access to treatment and rehabilitation. This can include medication like suboxone and methadone, as well as therapy, fruit and vegetables, et cetera. Uh, next slide. So the, the third pillar is harm reduction, and I'm thrilled. Um, oh, I'm going to try my video off, see if that helps. Uh, so I'm thrilled to that RNO has that that it wasn't part of the community for a number of years, but that is specifically we introduced it. Um, and it was, of course, it's producing negative consequences of drug substance use. And the final pillar is enforcement, and that's addressing that illicit drug production supply and distribution. Next slide. Um, so this is the, the summary of the four pillar strategy. So I think what's really important to know is that in order to effectively reduce harms associated with substance use, we need all four of these pillars. Uh, and more than that, they need to be really grounded in this strong evidence base. Um, so, bringing it back to the open crisis, while it is unfortunate that the crisis is ongoing and, and many people are still being harmed, um, I think there's also been a lot of innovative and exciting work done in these other that is important to highlight, and that's what I believe. The next speakers we'll, we'll be looking to as uh, the slide. So this is my my contact information. This is the story was started to hear. Um, so do feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions. I'll try and find some headphones and see if that helps for the audio and also stick around for question and answer period. So thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Bridget, for providing the introduction and framework for our discussion. And I'm fortunately that your mic didn't work. 
um, but I'm hoping the others will work a bit better. Um, so next we're gonna hear from Irene from Medify, joining us to discuss prevention and education. So Irene is the advanced practice nurse in the RAM clinic at Women's College Hospital and the nurse educator for Medify. She has a number of postgraduate certificates in substance use treatment and counseling approaches, including grief resolution counseling, trauma-informed care, indigenous cultural safety, and acceptance and commitment therapy. Irene has over 10 years of experience in managing substance use disorders and is highly involved in the education and capacity building of health professionals on medical and psychosocial approaches of managing substance use disorders in Canada and internationally. Irene is also involved in substance use and HIV related research activities and, ha and has authored and co-authored a number of publications and clinical tools. She has participated in several quality and practice improvement committees as an advisor and a content expert review and has presented at several conferences here in Canada and internationally. Her interest includes education, research and development of low barrier, trauma informed and culturally appropriate approaches to patient engagement in managing mental health and substance use disorders. Welcome Irene. Hi, Viviana, thank you so much for that warm introduction. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, you sound clear. All right. So, all right, so I'll be talking about Metafy, which is a provincial project that I work with. It's based at Women's College. And if you could flip over to the next slide, Leo. Well, that was for nurses, for Nurses Week. I'll still say Happy Nurses Week. And before I start, I would like to also introduce myself. As uh, uh, you can hear, I have an accent. My accent is Kenyan. And I consider myself a mother first, and then everything else comes after that. And one of my favorite things is food and some good company. So I will be talking today uh, a little bit about how we support prevention education uh, in regards to the work we do with Medify on opiate use disorders and also highlight how nurses across the province can support us in these efforts and, and what we've been doing uh, with education for nurses across the province. We'll go over to the next slide. Uh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge uh, the Metafy team. This is the wonderful team that I work with. Obviously I do not, and I cannot take credit for any of this work by myself. So we have our lead who is Dr. Melden Kahan, our program manager, Kate, uh, Sarah, who is our knowledge broker, Alan and Camille, who are addiction workers and educator, and also Leslie, who is our social worker for the team. So what is Metafy? I know it just sounds Metafy. So it stands for Mentoring, Education and Clinical Tools for Addiction primary care hospital integration. It's a mouthful, but that is what it stands for. And it's mainly a collaborative project to implement integrated pathways for addiction throughout Ontario. And what we do, we support RAM clinics, and I'll be talking a lot about RAM clinics in this presentation. Usually, Metafy partners with hospitals, with rural management services, family health teams, community health centers, and community agencies. And our goal is to improve care for patients with addictions, improve the care providers, um, the experiences that provider who, providers who provide this care to patients, and also uh, improve population health, uh, reduce service utilization, especially in emergency departments, and provide sustainable care. So in the next slide, you'll see what our model looks like. Um, on the top there, you see in that uh, kind of semicircle, um, all over people with alcohol or opiate use disorders. And these people can either go to any of these avenues. They can go to WMS, which is withdrawal management services. They can go to the hospital. They can go to see their psychiatrist. They can go to see their primary care provider. And at any of these points, they can be referred to the RAM clinic. And we usually aim to see patients within one to two days. So this is how uh, this uh, model works. So in, at any given point where a patient touches base, whether it is with a primary care doctor, in eMERGE, in a withdrawal or detox, uh, they are given, either provided with whatever concerns they present with, a brief counseling and whatever immediate treatment they need, and then they are referred to the rapid access addiction medicine. And that is what RAM starts for, for ongoing treatment. RAM clinics, they offer substance use disorder treatment on a walk-in basis, so patients do not need to uh, make an appointment. There's no formal referral, meaning anyone from this point can refer anyone just by giving them a card with an address and phone number where to go. 
And when they come to RAM, they are stabilized. Uh, and once they are stable on whatever treatment they were getting there, the goal is to, to return them to the primary care provider who was um, providing care for them. And if they didn't have one, then we work on connecting them with primary care. So the key components in this model is integration of care, training, support, and mentorship, and capacity building. So how did this uh, model start? I will walk through this very quickly. So dating back to 2015, there were only two existing RAM clinics. I was working in one of these clinics, which was the very first one at St. Joseph's Health Center in Toronto. I worked there for many years uh, before uh, the RAM model started expanding. And we did mentor the folks at St. Mike's uh, who started the second one. And then seven RAM clinics uh, were created during the MetaFi pilot which covered these areas listed here, London, Newmarket, Ottawa, Owen South, Tanya, and St. Catherine's and Sudbury. After this pilot, uh, Metafi got more funding and uh, between 2015 to 2017, to oversaw the implementation of the RAM model across Toronto Central Lean Hospitals. And the success of that led now to the expansion in 2018 to date of the RAM model formerly being endorsed by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care and becoming really a pillar for the provincial opiate strategy. We have now approximately seven Ontario clinics and we are still growing. Additionally, we've been uh, supporting clinics in other provinces, um, in, uh, in Manitoba, in BC, Nova Scotia, and there are consideration in other provinces. And our role continue to support and to implement best practices for addiction treatment. Let's go to the next. This is where all our clinics are located, kind of a Google map of where they are. Let's skip to the next slide, Liliana. So what is our role really in prevention? And I say this is, we, we try to promote uh, access uh, to treatment. And by promoting access, keeping in mind that the people that we see, they are highly stigmatized. They come with a lot of shame and guilt. They, they have a lot of fear and hesitation to connecting with the healthcare system. So we offer a very flexible model of care in where we don't need referrals. There's no wait times. You can walk in, in any realm that is open. Our intake assessments, they are not required. And so we meet the patients on a very trauma-informed model where we identify priorities the minute we sit down with the patient and define what that is for the patient and we walk from there. Uh, we offer medication-assisted treatment for both alcohol and opiates and other substances, short-term counseling and case management, referrals to community programs, and a lot of emphasis on eventual transfer to primary care because we believe that primary care is where these substance use disorders, just like any other chronic illnesses, should be managed. And otherwise, RAM clinics can adapt to fit the local needs of the community depending on what um, is presenting in front of us. So this is the Ontario Rams by setting, and this is just a kind of depiction of where we are. Most of them are in the hospitals. There are some community agencies, family health teams, and CAC also have some Rams located there. And a small majority are also in the uh, withdrawal management service. And there is a bus that also provides Ram services. This is clients who may be referred or benefit from RAM clinic. I will not go through this. I'll leave it there. And I just put it there so that people can have a glimpse of who may benefit from a referral to RAM. I say anyone who identifies with a struggle or substance use disorder, refer them. But that's kind of a quick guide. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so what happens at RAM? So when patients come in, we offer many services, uh, brief time-limited counseling. We offer anti-craving medications for alcohol use disorder opiate substitution therapy for opiate use disorder, take home naloxone kits for people who have um, ongoing opiate use injection, uh, harm reduction advice on ways to uh, reduce harm when they're using, strategies for reducing substance use, relief of mild to moderate withdrawal. Uh, we provide that community and residential program referrals. We do the, the uh, tools that are required before they go there, referral to recovery programs and groups, management of anxiety and mood disorders and connecting them to primary care. So, and then our role in education really focuses on capacity building and support for healthcare providers. This include nurses. Uh, this is another role that I do as uh, Lil introduced me. I am the advanced practice nurse in the RAM clinic, meaning I provide that direct clinical care three half days a week. Majority of my time is focused on education. And this is what I do. So we use, we leverage technology given that our scope is Ontario right now. 
So we have a lot of ways that we do that. We have monthly calls, we have patient engagement videos, patient pamphlets, best practice guide that we develop, community of practice. And we have a primary care handbook, we have a community worker guide that's all available on our website. We have withdrawal protocols and also we have our annual Metafy conference. I'll just explain a little bit of these uh, things in detail on the next slide. In terms of the provincial calls, and this would be a welcome invitation for all nurses who are listening tonight, uh, provincial video conferences are set for select audiences. We have one for prescribers, physicians, and nurse practitioners. We have four nurses across the board. We have four counselors and administrators. So they happen every second week uh, of the month. And the prescribers happen independent of the nurses and independent of the counselors and, the, uh, and administrators. In these video conferences, we do clinical discussions. We do troubleshooting on some difficult issues people may be experiencing and sharing successes also of how people are becoming innovative in their RAM clinics. Let's go to, and if you want to join, sorry about that, if you want to uh, kind of be included in the monthly calls, you can email Kate, who is our program manager, and she'll be able to sign you up for, for the next nurses call or provider's call. The other one is uh, patient engagement videos. This is another available video series of a panel discussion on ways to engage RAM clinic uh, patients in treatment. And this is not patients coming to RAM. This video discussions really talk about issues of trauma and how do you connect and establish rapport where there's a lot of stigma and shame and all of that. Uh, you can see a series that I actually participated in with my colleagues from other RAM clinics and that is also found in our website. I'll leave it to you to check it out. Uh, patient pamphlets, these are information that we develop and they are just simple brochures, uh, easy to understand, FAQ format. We have them in a the variety of formats. We have um, a topics, I mean, we have alcohol use disorder, alcohol and mood, alcohol withdrawal medications for alcohol use disorder and opiate use disorder, uh, opiate use disorder and pain medications and also information for families. So depending on who we are dealing with in our clinic, we can just give them a brochure even if they haven't made their mind so they can learn more, including the medications that we prescribe and the side effects and everything like that. Uh, best practices guide. Uh, this would be for anyone interested in learning to care for people with substance use disorders. It's an FAQ format document on best practices in land setting. It's available, downloadable on our website now. It had, all these questions were contributed by RAM clinicians and they cover approaches to RAM practice alcohol, opiates, benzos, stimulants, and also how to do counseling uh, for people who are still ambivalent. And the other one is a community of practice. This may also be on uh, 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 interesting to majority of the people. Uh, it's a Google group for healthcare providers across Ontario, and usually we discuss addiction-related clinical issues. You can email a clinical question. Obviously, this is monitored very closely, and patient information is de-identified before it is posted here for this group. And it's a very, very supportive group. It's very rich, the discussions that happen here. And if you would like to join the list, sub, you email Sarah, who is our knowledge blocker, and she manages this and she'll be glad to add you there. So our role in education, again, is on trauma-informed education for those working with high-risk populations. I am, this is my kind of work also, and this is where we target vulnerable and high-risk groups and people who work with them. So I've, I've reached out and I've done a lot of presentations and workshops to correction facilities, institutions of learning, social services, child welfare agencies, remote indigenous communities, and the Ontario Provincial Police. And uh, the, my last slide is a call for action. Really, based on the work that we do in Metafy, how can nurses support our education and prevention efforts? And this is not just nurses, it's anyone who interacts with these people, high risk, marginalized people. I say one I thing that we can always do is always show empathy and compassion for people who have opioid use disorders and provide brief counseling and support. It does not matter whether it's in the bus, it's in image, or whichever uh, context you interact with them just emphasize that there is help and strategies for brief counseling are available in our website, very brief that you can utilize, provide harm reduction advice and offer naloxone kit if there is in danger of uh, overdose. Information is also available on our website and always if you can do nothing else, refer them to a nearby RAM clinic. A list of all RAM clinics across Ontario are listed on our website with the address and phone numbers that you can reach directly. 
So that brings me to the end. I will leave it to Liliana to tell me when I can answer some questions, but thank you very much for listening and I wish you all safety at this time. Thank you so much, Irene. That was a fantastic presentation on prevention education, as well as the work being done by Medify and yourself. You're just a wealth of resources, and I hope everyone that's here will access some of those links and contacts that Irene has shared with us. I just mentioned in the question box as well that we will be posting the slides with the recording, so you will be able to access um, those contacts and emails later on. Uh, and I'll save the questions for the discussion period. So next we'll have Terry Nicholson and Christine Gugliotti joining from Surya Hospital and the Surya Hospital Ram Clinic. So Terry is a registered psychotherapist and the concurrent disorders counselor at Surya Hospital. She's also the chair of the Hussein Marie and Area Drug Strategy. Terry has 20 years of experience in the treatment of mental health and addictions and has worked in numerous locations, including Thunder Bay, downtown Vancouver, Maple Ridge, BC, New Zealand, downtown Ottawa, and now Sault Ste. Marie. Her presentation will provide insight into treatment methods for empowering those who are opioid dependent to engage in harm reduction and recovery. And following Terry, we'll have Christine. Christine has been a registered practical nurse for the past 11 years and has worked in mental health and addictions at Surya Hospital for the past five years. She was part of the Code White Committee to help improve safety within Surya Hospital and has since been working at the RAM clinic that serves the residents of the Algoma district who have substance abuse issues, primarily concerning addictions uh, to opioids and alcohol. Christine will be sharing a bit about the RAM clinic and opioid use disorder treatment. Welcome, Christine and Terry. We're happy you can join us. You'll just have to unmute yourselves. All right, are we good to go? Can you hear us? Yes, you're good to go. Okay, we can go to my first slide, please. Okay, so keeping in mind, a lot of my information is anecdotal and from conversations with the patients that I've worked with over the 20 years I've been doing this. Um, the reality of opioid use disorder is that the dependence on the opioid impacts the individual in catastrophic ways. In order to finance their addiction, locate the drugs, use the drugs, feel the effects of the drug, avoid the withdrawal from the drugs, and recover from the use of the drugs, individuals find themselves in close contact with law enforcement, child protection services, landlords and emergency shelters, sexual predators, crisis services, emergency health care, gangs, human traffickers, and worse. Once you are able to build a rapport with a client who has had this type of recent history, treatment becomes focused on stabilization of this myriad of cause and effects. Housing, shelter, food security, going back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Stabilize these three factors and you may be able to engage someone in more intensive treatment. Um, one thing I was thinking of when I was creating the slides um, and reviewing the slides is that nothing is carte blanche. Nothing, um, you can't create a treatment plan and it's gonna work for every patient. Make sure that everything is flexible, everything is um, able to be changed at a moment's notice. Um, we benefit from creative methods that work, with, that work to build people up rather than break them down. We need to address our prevalent social issues, increase opportunities for everyone, encourage a reconnection to community, and drastically increase support for trauma to increase capacity to deliver trauma-informed care to each member of society. Like Irene was saying about trauma-informed care, trauma-informed care is a way of working that is universal. It's built on the premise that every client should be treated as though they may have a history of traumatic experience. Within the care we provide, we need to promote safety. We need to promote transparency, absolutely choice, collaboration with the client, with the patient, empowerment, again, to build people up, and cultural competency. Next slide, please. Uh, this was just something that um, I took from another presentation as far as how to how to provide trauma-informed care in the environment, especially um, here in the hospital that I'm working in. Um, treating every patient and client that you speak with as if they have a trauma history, establishing a rapport before asking historical information, providing a supportive interview setting with privacy and no interruptions. Um, busy hospitals, sometimes that's, that seems more challenging than it needs to be, but um, the privacy, the ability to provide a confidential um, interview is, is critical. Um, and waiting for self-report assessments until the intoxication or the withdrawal is passed. Um, you need to provide 
treatment, of course, in emergency settings as far as withdrawal goes, but uh, being able to wait to get the historical information to build the big treatment plan um, until the withdrawal has passed is, is quite useful. Okay. Um, the next thing I wanted to mention is strength-based treatment. So strength-based treatment is the, it's a social work idea, it comes from Selby. It's one of the ideas that um, we need to work on what people are good at in order to create the plan. As an addictions counselor, we're not in, in charge, right? We're just a guide, someone to walk along the recovery path. So research shows that clinicians who focus on strengths get better outcomes. Assessments and interventions that focus on deficit, diagnosis, dysfunction, and delinquency have been criticized for missing the strengths and the resiliency of our clients. Next. Instead of asking what's wrong with people, it helps to ask what's right with people. Focusing on the assessment and treatment of deficits, aberrations, and symptoms, what is wrong with people, has led to a tremendous sense of hopelessness and despair among both clients and behavioral health practitioners who serve them. Um, those of you who are familiar with Gabor Mate know that he says, rather than ask uh, what's wrong with you, ask what happened to you. It's just a different way of looking at things when you're doing the assessment. Um, next. My favorite is the promoting the idea of unconditional support in treatment. Um, making sure you're conveying the message that you will have my support when you are sober, when you are high or drunk, when you are messed up or you're aching, you will have my support when you're happy, sad, lost, or found. The art of recovery is not about the absence of the substance. It's about creating a life that one doesn't want to escape from. It's really about connection as opposed to disconnection. Thanks. Motivational interviewing is the work of treatment, absolutely. Um, hands down, it's the best way to complete interventions um, interviews, assessments, and provide information about the plan. And it goes back to the collaboration that we talked about with trauma-informed care. Uh, motivational interviewing supports the idea that improved outcomes can be witnessed through the voice of the client. People who speak of hope and reasons to recover are more likely to make the system work for them. Clinicians who encourage this conversation will see more impact from the treatment plan. Clinicians who do more listening than speaking will see clients who are more invested in the work of recovery. Basic motivational interviewing skills, probably a review for most of you. Express empathy, develop discrepancy, roll with resistance, support self-efficacy. Basic skills, open-ended questions, listening reflectively, affirming, not cheering, we're not cheerleaders. You've worked hard. Some people that have completed what you've completed have felt proud, right? Those kind of things, not way to go, I'm so proud of you, because what we think really doesn't, doesn't necessarily matter. Um, summarize and elicit change talk. Next. Being the right door, this is so critical and I know that it's difficult in uh, today's climate, absolutely. Um, there should be no wrong door, right? You should be able to provide some sort of help within the addiction system at every door. Act as a guide through the mental health and addiction system. The system can appear intimidating for many reasons. Fear, stigma, literacy, perception of judgment, uh, previous failures, perceived failures, the shame and the guilt like Irene talked about that go along with addiction. Um, you as the information hub, you do not make up answers. If you don't know, you find out and you report back. Next. And my last slide, recovery happens. Uh, programs that welcome clients back with genuine care and concern will have the most success stories to tell when this crisis is over and I have faith it will be over. I'll hand it over to Christine. Hi everybody. I'm not gonna go through um, everything that Irene kind of covered about what RAM is about, so we might skip a few slides. Um, what I'm gonna talk about more is what our RAM clinic does in the Algoma district and our locations. So Lil, if you wanna go to the next slide, Irene already covered this kind of stuff. Um, so the core responsibilities of the RAM clinic, and this is like all throughout Ontario primarily, is we, we diagnose clients that are struggling with substance use disorders um, and concurrent mental health disorders. If indicated, we will initiate some pharmacotherapy. Point of care urine testing is done at the start of with most appointments, and then it's at the discretion of the provider. Um, we offer harm, product, harm reduction and interventions for and advice. We do have um, brief counseling. Um, 
So primarily what we have is our team in the Algoma is in the Sault Ste. Marie is our hub site. And then we have a team of nurse practitioner and some of our doctors and myself as the nurse and an addictions navigator. Within our location, we also have addiction counselors as well. Um, and then we have some spoke sites. So myself and our addiction navigator, we travel to very, very small rural areas and we have partnership with the physicians there in the community. So we have one office in St. Joe's Island, we have one in Cessalon, and we have one in, Blank, in Bruce Mines. Um, and then we also have one up north in Wawa, which is run by a nurse practitioner there as well. Um, so primarily what we do is when we see our clients is we will do an intake with them and find out what they're struggling with, what their treatment goals will be, and we work with them from that point on. Next slide, Bill. So for opioid-wise, we're gonna talk about Suboxone. That's our first line of treatment for any clients that are struggling with opioid use. What I'm gonna kind of talk about is how we initiate it, what we look for, the assessments that we do um, in our office. So for Suboxone, ideally any clients that we see that's using any type of opioids, whether it's short acting or long acting, we provide them with that education prior to the first appointment, letting them know that they do need to abstain for 12 to 24 hours. Depending on what their use, we really encourage more on the 24 hour or longer and explain to them that they are gonna feel a lot of withdrawal symptoms and we offer them some support through that. With support, we'll offer some comfort kits. So it'll have um, Gatorades and offer some Imodium, some ginger gravel, stuff like that, things to keep them distracted. When they get in to see us, they'll meet with myself first and we'll do some, I'll do a triage with them. We, I'll complete a clinical opioid withdrawal scale, known as their COWS assessment. So we need to have our clients in a moderate state of withdrawal before we can go ahead and provide them with their first dose of Suboxone. So what happens is when we get, when we see them, we'll do the point of care task and we assess them for their COWS score and then they'll see the doctor or the nurse practitioner we initiate a, a dose first and it's always a low dose. We'll usually start between two to four milligrams. They'll go to the pharmacy, take their dose. It's a witness dose, sublingual under the tongue. And then we ask them to come back and see us about an hour later. So then we can see that the withdrawal symptoms are getting better. First day, there's a little bit of a back and forth because we're trying to find that optimal dose where we can treat those withdrawal symptoms and it's gonna last for that 24 hour marker. Um, once we get to some stabilization, then their appointments are usually once a week. Um, and then we, when they're stable and things are going well, we will transfer them back to their primary care provider if they do have one. Go ahead, Lil. So typical withdrawal symptoms that we um, ex are expecting to see from our clients when they're coming in, and we do provide them with that education before is, um, that they're gonna they're gonna feel pretty pretty uncomfortable. They're gonna have a hard time sleeping. They're gonna have a lot of cravings. They're gonna have the hot and cold sweats, goosebumps, um, runny nose, tearing of the eyes, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, cramping, a lot of bone and muscle pain, muscle tension. Their mood will fluctuate. They will they can be agitated, anxious, um, pretty tearful. Um, so we 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 work with through all of that. Once they get that dose of Suboxone, usually their first dose, you'll see a lot of this will start reversing. Go ahead, Lil. So the biggest part of what is important for us is to remember that when we're providing that education to the patient is that they, they have to be, we really encourage for them to be honest with us and to make sure that we know how long they have abstained. Because if somebody has used an opioid and we've gone ahead and provided them with a dose of Suboxone, and that opioid has not been out of their system, we can cause precipitated withdrawal, which is essentially severe withdrawal symptoms that are very, very uncomfortable that just we have to help support them through. So when we do that cows assessment and making sure that their scores are over and above 12, and we start with a low dose primer, it's usually very safe that they won't go into that precipitated withdrawal. Go ahead. 
I'm sure everybody knows how opioids can cause an overdose. So for time-wise, I'm not gonna go through it, but the slides are there. Um, go ahead and switch that, Will. And then just for some important, important reminders about of opioids and prescribed opioids is always make sure that you're taking what is prescribed to you. Don't give away, don't share. Um, it's very important to educate clients about the use of opioids with alcohol or benzodiazepines. Um, and if you're not using anything or to always encourage them when they come into treatment with us, is we always ask like, do you, what do you have left at home or what friends are, what, who's in your network? And just to make sure that there isn't any triggers and we'll encourage them to take what they have and bring it back to the pharmacies or will they can bring it into us and we'll go ahead and dispose of it in our medicine box as well. So go ahead. Okay, that's it. Thanks guys. Awesome. Thank you so much, Terry and Christine, um, for giving us a good overview on treatment and recovery, as well as all the frontline work you're doing on this issue. It's really fantastic, especially for the Sioux and area. So thank you so much. Next up, we have Lisa Toner, the Outreach Community Coordinator for Rizzo Access Network, who will be discussing harm reduction. Lisa has been working in harm reduction, HIV, and hepatitis C in Northern Ontario for over a decade, and is a harm reduction activist and advocate who is committed to decreasing preventable overdose deaths in our communities. Lisa has been on the front lines of the drug poisoning and overdose crisis and is championing appropriate grief support in the workplace while advocating provincially for the needs of the Sudbury, Manitoulin region. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. I'll get you to go to the first slide. Can everyone hear me? Sounds good. Perfect. Um, and next slide. Um, so I was asked to talk a little bit about the organization that I work for, my position, and the, the pillar that I'm representing. Uh, so our programming at Razo Access Network um, and our prevention services are rooted in harm reduction. And it's the concept and philosophy that we work within at Razo Access Network. We work with the three H's, which is HIV, hepatitis, and harm reduction. Next slide. So I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator of the Hepatitis C Treatment Team at Razo Access Network. And the population that we work with is people who use drugs, primarily opioid dependent individuals. And my role is to bridge the gap from street into our services with a focus on hepatitis C treatment. I also work in education to build capacity in other organizations to serve the population and understand their needs. Um, I've worked specifically in harm reduction since the beginning of my career almost 15 years ago and have represented the pillar of harm reduction at our community drug strategy until early 2019 when I passed it uh, along to a colleague so that I could prioritize advocacy on a provincial level for the needs of the North. Next slide. So for those of you that it, it helps to see the numbers, to grasp the severity of the situation, I just want to put a reminder in that the next couple of slides are about stats and that every single number that we see on these stats represents a human life lost, our fellow Canadians and community members. So it's really not just numbers, it's human beings. I just wanted to highlight that in uh, less than three years, uh, 14,700 uh, Canadians died of apparent opioid overdose um, overdoses. Next slide. Also wanted to mention that um, there were close to 20,000 individuals who made it into the hospital as a result of an opioid poisoning. And we know that that's just a fraction of individuals who are actually experiencing opioid overdoses. Um, the stats that our team shows is only about one in seven opioid overdoses actually makes it not even necessarily to the hospital, but into EMS services. Um, in Ontario specifically, there has been a spike in overdoses across the province over the last week. Next slide. Uh, locally, so in Sudbury, Ontario, um, so a couple of things to highlight on this slide would be that in 2017, the rate of overdoses was at 8.9 per 100,000, and in the Sudbury, Manitoulin district, it was almost twice that at 17. Also from January 2019 to June 2019, so in a six-month period, um, from 2018 to 2019, 
um, overdose deaths um, more than doubled in our region. So back to the drug poisoning, pretty serious stuff. So how did we get to this point? Um, so we got to a toxic drug supply that's poisoning Canadians by the tens of thousands as a result of prohibition-based drug policy, not necessarily over-prescribing. So I think that we can all agree that OxyContin was over-marketed, heavily incentivized, um, and, and that's reality of the situation. But as a frontline worker, I'd get, give anything to be back in the time where oxys were the most lethal drug on the street. At this point in time, um, in the situation that I'm working in, that seems like a heavenly utopia. So having just OxyContin be the most lethal drug on the street would be a wonderful place to be back at, unfortunately. So uh, on to the next slide. So this happened as a result of tougher laws, weak drug policy backed by little, little evidence. So the reality of the situation over uh, time has proven that the tougher the laws, the stronger and more toxic the drugs become. And a great historic example of that is moonshine during alcohol prohibition um, in the 30s. So alcohol prohibition fueled organized crime and prohibition continues to fuel organized crime today. So how do we fix it? The reality is this slide should actually say, how do we help? Because I'm working with a group of nurses and speaking to a group of nurses, not a bunch of plumbers. So I think the solutions are realistically um, employing and engaging people with lived and living expertise at every level. So it seems pretty obvious to bring the experts to the table or in this situation, the panel. I can guess that nobody on the panel today is opioid dependent or is directly impacted by drug policy. The next would be decriminalization. So um, decriminalizing all drugs and re reallocating funds into support for people who use drugs. And don't worry, the next speaker, Trevor, will still have a job after this. So um, the Portugal model has seen incredible evidence-based success. That's the thing about harm reduction. It's all evidence-based, researched, proven, and practical solutions that keep the human rights and self-determination of people impacted at their core. Seems pretty simple, right? Uh, the next point I have is SCS, SIS, OPS, CTS, or what I like to call um, acronym SOUP. So supervised consumption services, supervised injection sites, overdose prevention sites, and consumption and treatment services, which is what the Ford government is calling it in Ontario right now. So I don't think I need to explain what these types of services are to nurses, but the reality is they are not a magical solution, but they will and have undoubtedly saved lives. Helped more people access health and support services um, and keep communities safer. We obviously need other techniques and other programs as well, because not everyone who uses opioids will access these sites, as some folks are lucky enough to be housed. Um, we need overdose uh, response hotlines, phone apps, and other creative life-saving models that are researched and effective, meet the needs of those who are utilizing them, and employ people who get it. The next point is safe supply. And I think that a lot of people think that safe supply is this really radical idea, but the reality of safe supply is that it's not. So I'll explain a little bit more in the next slide. So Dr. Andrea Sereda, working out of London Intercommunity Health Center, has had a safe supply program that's been running since 2016. There's also many other safe supply programs running out of Ottawa and the downtown east side. So Dr. Andrea Sereda has taken the uh, narrative that's often used by people who use drugs that's called they talk, we die, and changed it to we act and they live. So evidence um, of her program is outstanding. 
So a direct quote from Dr. Sereda is, the changes that we have seen in how people use drugs and what they use is better than we could have hoped for. I want you to remember that everyone in our safe supply program has failed standard addiction treatment. And I'll actually change that by saying standard addiction treatment has failed them. Um, everyone who entered had an intent to keep on using injection drugs, albeit in a safer way. And yet, there was a reduction in harmful drug use habits, so a decrease from injection drug use to taking it orally. There was a re reduction in fentanyl exposure, a reduction in crystal meth use. In the four years the program has been running, there are zero fatal overdoses, zero mortality from complications of IDU. 100% um, engagement with HIV treatment, zero new cases of endocarditis, an increase in connection and access to hepatitis C treatment. Um, prior to the Safe Supply program, her patients uh, did not access primary care services. Safe Supply patients interact with the clinical provider every week and chip away at their chronic disease management and preventative care. They see wraparound services for case management, hepatitis C and HIV treatment, as I mentioned, have access to a social work team and see a psychiatrist. They have 100% um, access to routine care and 100% uptake. Uh, acute care, wound care, chronic disease management, cancer screening, mental health care. There's a reduction in homelessness, an increase in connection to income, a huge reduction in survival sex work. But patients are connected to outreach teams. There, there's been um, an over 45 percent reduction in the crime associated with getting the money to buy drugs. And these are just a few of the successes from her program. So I'm, I'm wondering my, to myself, could this be the heavenly utopia that I spoke of earlier? So the next slide, how will I know that I've made it in my career? Um, I'll know that I've made it when somebody who has a greater and more vast lived and living experience takes my job and excels at it. That will be my career culmination and the success that I want to achieve. What about you? How will you help? How will you intervene? How will you support those most impacted by the drug poisoning crisis? What will your part be? Will you be able to look back at this and say, and say that you made an impact, one that you're proud of, one that showed positive results and improved the health and lives of people who are opioid de dependent? I sure hope so. Next slide. So if folks are interested in contacting me um, to refer patients that they might have that are living with hepatitis C in the Sudbury Manitoulin area, we can help support them with hepatitis C treatment services. Anywhere else across the province, we can help connect people, particularly in the Northeast, to a team of folks that can provide hepatitis C treatment. Or if anyone has more would like more information on Dr. Serrata's program and how you can integrate safe supply for you for your patients that are in need, then don't be shy to contact me and I can provide that information. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lisa. And I really appreciate you giving us those kind of questions and thoughts to ponder at the end. I think some of them are pretty heavy weighted, but it's also a good reminder that we really do have a spot to listen and use these resources and start taking some action for those of us who are maybe not working on it quite yet. Um, so thank you very, very much for sharing. So last, but definitely not least, and before we let um, Detective Constable Trevor Plus speak, I'm just going to say we might run a bit over time, but I do welcome you all to stay logged in with us. We are going to have some time at the end for questions, and our speakers will stay to answer as many as we can, as best we can uh, as well. So as I mentioned, um, Detective Constable Trevor Plus has been a detective with the Sault Ste. Marie Police Services since 2014. Since January 2020, Trevor has been assigned to the Drug Enforcement Unit of the Investigative Services Division, where he investigates criminal and drug-related offenses. He has previously worked in Investigative Services, Major Crime Unit, uh, Traffic Enforcement, and General Patrol. So thank you, Trevor, for agreeing to speak with us today about enforcement and to share some of your own kind of experiences and observations from your work. So I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much, Lil. Um, so good evening to everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, to get right into it, um, when speaking about the enforcement pillar, 
Uh, essentially, we're looking to identify and investigate and hold those accountable who produce, import, and traffic illegal drugs. Uh, years ago, um, Oxycontin had been removed from the market. Something essentially had to fill the void. Unfortunately, it was fentanyl that took that place. Um, originally, what I found to be our largest problem that we were dealing with locally was fentanyl patches. Uh, with the implementation of the patches, um, the patch for patch program, it actually proved to be quite successful to help curb this issue. And locally, we haven't seized the fentanyl patch since roughly 2015. Uh, in 2016, we did make our first seizure of illicit fentanyl powder. Uh, and at that time, it very much resembled what um, the white powder that we suspect cocaine to look like. Um, as time went on, we started to find the majority of heroin seized going closer to the year 2018 was either a mixture of fentanyl uh, or straight fentanyl uh, starting to hit the open market. Um, it was very difficult to tell the difference uh, during those times by looking at the drug, whether it was mixed or solely just straight fentanyl. And uh, as you can see, the one slide I have here, and I wanted to keep a one slide up um, so that way everyone was able to see throughout uh, what kind of aspects of different, these are all different aspects of fentanyl that have been seized and uh, confirmed to be fentanyl. Over the last few years, uh, and up to even as recently as uh, the last couple months, all the various different forms of fentanyl, um, they're now coming in all different colors, textures, and forms, uh, including in the top left, um, real life that uh, looks like a putty, so very similar to children's Play-Doh. Um, pressed pills, the uh, second or the middle slide on the right is uh, was uh, made and distributed to look like oxys. Um, as you can see, different powders and uh, rock-like substances now coming in a variety of colors. Um, this is something that we're starting to find very unique to just fentanyl. Um, as you can imagine, the process of mixing these substances is less than scientific, often occurring in a consumer-grade blender. Um, traffickers are typically attempting to mix one part fentanyl to about 100 parts cutting agent. Um, cutting agents we're starting to find are, are caffeine, um, not as much dextrose as before, but Basically, with these results, you're going to end up with complete inaccuracies when trying to determine the potency of any of the end products. The end result, essentially, is oftentimes a product with the unknown potency, where what we're finding is that a user will um, purchase and ingest its normal amounts and product of said uh, fentanyl, in this particular case. And if the, the substance isn't quite up to the potency they're used to, they'll ingest more. Uh, to reach that same high. Um, this obviously posts risks. On the flip side to that, uh, they'll ingest their uh, normal amount that they're accustomed to and that they're tolerant to, and it's actually um, far more important than they're used to. Um, so it goes without saying, what we found is either scenario is potentially fatal, and we have seen those results. And unfortunately, we have um, heard and seen at times in regards to an overdose, um, is very unfortunate is that at times in the drug subculture it will be received as a positive advertisement for that dealer and or his or her product. Um, through the inaccuracies in mixing an opiate to maximize the dealer's profits, persons are quite often seeing when someone overdoses that they believe this product and this dealer to have more of a pure substance available for sale and thus unfortunately it's more sought after. Um, in Sault Ste. Marie, um, it varies as much as uh, markets do from Northern Ontario to Southern Ontario and across Canada, but here in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, fentanyl on the street that's cut, um, so that's obviously not pure fentanyl, is going between $40 and $60 per point. Uh, point is a tenth of a gram, uh, so very, very, very small. So to equivalent that, cost per gram is around four to $600, and uh, with 1,000 grams and a kilogram, uh, fentanyl is worth about half a million dollars at the kilo level. Um, so there is, without saying, a lot of money and motivation on the trafficking side, and that's where our focus lies. Um, my uh, team I work with closely here. Um, fentanyl can be ingested using the same methods um, that typical heroin would normally be used, uh, such as injection or smoking. Um, those are the most common ones we're seeing. Um, but simply to remind everyone, um, and I know a vast majority of people here are nurses, um, even simple exposure to your skin, um, can cause uh, unwanted reactions or uh, fatal reactions. Some of our examples that have been analyzed by Health Canada have shown to include various analogs of fentanyl, which also pose issues. Uh, 
specifically carfentanil. Carfentanil is uh, an analog that is 100 times more potent than fentanyl. Um, when such drugs like this are detected, it takes investigators and local officials time to prepare and disseminate public health notices uh, so everyone is aware as well as our public. We are in contact with other agencies such as the Drug Strategy Committee, local paramedics and hospital staff. Uh, if we do see any increasing trends in an overdose uh, or overdose cases, we try to relay that information uh, to each other on both sides the best we can so everyone's uh, together and in the loop. Um, with, re with respect to opiate poisoning, um, we often find ourselves in terms of investigation, immediate challenges right off the bat. If a person is um, attended to in relation to opiates uh, and or brought to the hospital, and from a medical standpoint, police are typically not notified and not involved. Um, and if a person is brought to the hospital and uh, passes away, sometimes we aren't notified until much later after the fact. When we return to investigate the scene where a patient uh, was um, last with and taken by ambulance uh, and they became deceased, evidence is sometimes removed prior to our arrival. Witnesses will sometimes panic and try to protect the deceased from the stigma of, of their drug use. Um, at times, persons directly involved with opiates, whether as a user, a dealer, supplier, or even a witness, are reluctant to provide police with the information that would assist uh, with an investigation as to how the disease came about getting the drugs that led to their unfortunate death. So with that kind of being said, without a witness, uh, there to observe a transaction poses grave challenges on our end to hold someone accountable during a prosecution. Um, this is an area that we are always looking to improve. We recognize and we are working with, with our community, but it does remain a reality. Um, Another hurdle that we do face with drug investigations is the amount of time that it'll take, for example, to be processed with Health Canada. Um, just by sheer volume of services, Health Canada's workload, and uh, the amount of time it does take to process a sample. And oftentimes with fentanyl, there are so many analogs that Health Canada uh, may not have a standard to compare with yet for its um, And so sometimes these can take several months. Um, and then that plays into a recent court ruling for the legal aspects is uh, known as R versus Jordan. And this essentially states that the Crown must try their case in its entirety within 18 months of the offense date. If not, the court could rule that the delay is unconstitutional for the accused. Um, with that, this has posed uh, grave challenges to us as investigators. During the enforcement and court process, uh, the accused, which uh, what I'm referring to here as being the drug traffickers and dealers are constantly uh, being more, lack of a better term, schooled when they're arrested and receive disclosure. Every time they go to court, they learn a little bit more about how we as police conduct investigations. As technology is constantly evolving, um, traffickers do are finding new ways to insulate themselves from our investigations. Um, in order to evolve with these trends, we do have officers as well as um, specifically with uh, myself and the unit I work with, are constantly participating in training and seminars to keep current with our craft. Um, we're also spending a great deal of time training and practicing safe handling of these substances given how dangerous they can be. And as a department, we do, uh, sorry, we will continue to enter into drug trafficking investigations. Depending on the circumstances of the investigation, we will lay the appropriate charges and use every authority that we have uh, to seize their product uh, but not only that, uh, their money that they um, are made uh, through this uh, illegal subculture, as well as their assets they've gained um, by trafficking our drugs uh, when we're able to. So kind of where we go from here. I, um, our way forward that I believe from a policing standpoint is to continue to investigate the drug trafficking um, occurrences, especially at opiate related deaths. Um, but more, we also need to build and foster relationships with the other agencies and services. Doing things like this has brought uh, a lot more information to everyone involved, I believe. We need to continue stuff uh, like that to, in order to help the citizens. And ultimately, if we can investigate the trafficking of opiates and hold these drug traffickers responsible through our justice system, uh, it'll assist in protecting and saving lives. Um, and that's where I have, uh, at this point, um, in relation to the question, the ones listed, yeah, these are just specifically fentanyl. Um, they're, uh, none of these have specifically been tested for their potency. 
um, but they have all tested as fentanyl, um, from purple putty to purple uh, powder to green rocks to blue rocks to red rocks, green pills. I thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Char, for joining us, especially last last minute to fill in. We really appreciate it. I think it's a couple things drawn away from there. One, the cost is always mind blowing to hear, I think, for a lot of people, but also the need for collaboration um, in order to solve a lot of these issues and tackle the problem. I think that was a theme identified by almost everyone and that there's still a lot of challenges in all of the pillars to overcome being not a new topic, but actually being brought forward to the table as a kind of a bigger challenge for everyone to take charge of. So thank you so much. So with that, that concludes our presentations. We're going to open the, I want to say open the floor, but we'll open the chat box to any questions from anyone participating, as well as if any of the panelists have questions for other panelists. And we'll have um, our chapter president from Sudbury, who's David Grew and Nipa Singh, Catherine Ewers, to bring forward the questions. And our speakers, once they brought forward the question, feel free to jump in at any point. Oh, hi, so we've had a number of questions actually posed in both the Q&A and the chat box. So uh, perhaps I'll start with the Q&A questions. So there was a question around, um, so Jenna Dickinson made the comment, so RAM is not detox, but rather a medical approach to addictions management. So I'm wondering uh, who would be able to answer that, Christine or? I am happy to answer that. This is Irene. Irene, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, I, yeah, that is correct. So, RAM is is a model that facilitates easy access to care. And in RAM clinic, people can access treatment. They can access uh, counseling. They can also access detox through the withdrawal management services, which we have collaborated with. So, it is that point of access for the client or the patient. And once they come to us whichever path they want to follow, whether they want to just do counseling, they want to start a medication, they want to go to detox, they want to go to rehab, we have capacity to facilitate that for them. Great, thank you. Uh, there are a couple of questions around where RAM clinics are, but I think Irene, you, you've outlined those in your presentation and uh, we can refer back to those if, if we wanted to know specifically. Certainly, and they are all listed on our MetaFi website, which is on my slides. Perfect, thank you. Um, how is RAM and Sault Ste. Marie supported or works in collaboration with WHS and residential treatment services like the Oak Center in Elliott Lake? So maybe Christine, you want to? Yeah, I got it. Um, so with us, we support with, if any of our patients are struggling and they're not able to abstain, then we will support them in getting over to our withdrawal management. We'll provide a warm handoff to the um, workers here. And then we do close check-ins with them until we can get them to the intake appointment with us at RAM. I often will come to the hospital and come and see patients as well that are an inpatient and they're interested in RAM and they're going to be discharged soon. And then in regards to the Oaks, um, but this also goes for any treatment facility, it's not just Elliott Lake. Uh, if any of our clients identify that they are interested and they want to go to treatment, we will help facilitate that. We will support them through it when they to that for them to go to treatment. And then when they come back, we will support them upon their return back to Sault Ste. Marie and just kind of work with whatever treatment plan that they have developed from whatever treatment facility they have gone to. Great, thank you. Uh, another question, are any of you providing alternative pain management therapies beyond psychotherapy, such as massage, acupuncture, tapping aromatherapy. Hi, I can speak from my perspective um, here at Sumeria Hospital and as a concurrent disorders counselor that we are not providing any of those therapies. Um, I'd be interested to learn more if there's options for those um, in this district. That'd be fantastic. Thanks. Thank you. And also speaking for, for MetaFi and our partners across the province, I haven't heard of any clinic that is offering those. And if there is, if I know more information, I'll definitely share that out. Excellent, thank you. Uh, when a person uses a very potent mix uh, of, I guess, fentanyl, a one use of naloxone may not be enough. And it, it was posed in a question. So I'm wondering if um, someone want, would want to respond to that. 
I can. So um, definitely uh, when it comes to fentanyl and all of its analogs, particularly higher potency like carfentanyl, um, there have been cases where more than one, um, especially injection, but as well intranasal naloxone is required to reverse an overdose and most ministry funded um, naloxone packages that can be found at local public health units or pharmacies come with two doses. Great, thank you, Lisa. Uh, this question is for Trevor. Uh, will there ever be more support for expediting or expanding the lab services for the Ontario justice system? I, I would like to believe so. Um, in terms of Health Canada right now, uh, Center of Forensic Sciences uh, also assists us in uh, other other ways. But in terms of Health Canada with uh, sampling and analysis, um, I'd like to believe uh, they will. Um, workloads uh, change in that capacity. And I, I apologize, I don't have a, a direct straight answer for you on that. Um, a big uh, issue right now is obviously COVID's played a factor. And then uh, so for, for them, but for us, prioritizing what is getting sampled and why and for what matters in terms of whether it's in relation to a death or whether it's in relation to a court. So um, I would have to reach out to other colleagues for a more direct answer on that, but um, that's kind of where we're at. Great, thank you, Trevor. And one more question before I turn it over to Catherine uh, to review some of the questions on the chat. But uh, this question is from Christy. Do you anticipate a flux in the drug market as a result of COVID-19 interruptions and in drug trafficking routes, i.e. recent opium bust in Belleville? How is SSM and surrounding area pursuing drug market monitoring? How do you anticipate this to affect the lives of drug users who may not know what they are injecting? So um, in relation to COVID, obviously the, the world has completely changed and everyone's adapting, including uh, the drug sub subculture. What we've already started to find is, uh, is changing pricing. Um, pricing has gone up with obviously demand is less, or sorry, demand is more and supply is less. Um, this, uh, this has obviously presented issues. In terms of trafficking routes, um, I wouldn't say too much has changed. We are uh, monitoring uh, areas and working with other agencies that are able to assist us, whether it be other police agencies or um, working with our treatment and remand centers as well as the border services. Um, but and then anticipating uh, the effects of the lives of drug users for who may not know what they're injecting. Um, it's funny, uh, one of the th first things I always ask people when, uh, when we're, we're talking with them about drugs and, and their use is if they trust their dealer. Um, because that's always the biggest issue of where they're getting their stuff from and how they're getting it. Um, as much as we want to be able to make sure we can prosecute traffickers, we also are here to ensure that their lives are protected. That's why um, it is concerning. Uh, anytime even uh, supply slows down, uh, there uh, is concerns that people will start trying to become self uh, and things that they see fit. So we, uh, we do our best to educate them and as well as continue to just respond to COVID interruptions as we can. But the market is uh, changing a little bit, but we are staying on top of that. Great, thank you. Um, sorry, Catherine, can I just, I have one more question here that uh, was posed. Just to let you know um, that the, um, the chat is the same as the questions. So there's nothing different on the chat, so go ahead. Oh, really? Okay. No. Um, psychologically speaking, why does giving Suboxone too early precipitate withdrawal? So maybe that might be for Terry or Christine, maybe. So it's really important to make sure that when we are assessing our patients, as I said, it's in the slide too, um, we don't want to give them that Suboxone too, too early if they had utilized any opioids because the opioid that they are using is going to be stuck onto that receptor in their brain 
And if we go ahead and give that dose of Suboxone and it's still adhered, um, then they will go ahead and have more withdrawal symptoms that are a lot more severe. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Maybe I can also uh, add into that, that Suboxone actually have very high affinity to the opiate receptors. And what happens is it almost has capacity to displace any opiate from the receptors. And so let's say, for example, somebody took some morphine and you gave them too early before the morphine actually left the receptor. Suboxone is more powerful and we just displace that. And that is what kicks in the withdrawal because that the, the binding of that opiate and the receptor has now been discontinued and withdrawal kicks in, which is much more painful than the withdrawal they would feel from just uh, the morphine leaving the receptors. Thank you. I think there was one other question too about whether we could get a list of the RAM clinics for um, the Northern area. I know in the presentation you said there's 70 in Ontario, but it would be great maybe if we could um, just find out what's available in the north. I already answered it, I typed it out, um, but as Irene said, if you go to the Medify website, it shows a full entire map of all of our RAM clinics, and it has their contact information, everything, but primarily for the north, um, I, like I had said, we have Sault Ste. Marie, Thessalon, St. Rose Island, Bruce Mines, Wawa, and then go out to Thunder Bay. Great, thank you very much. Okay, perfect. With that, I think we'll close our question period. So thank you to everyone who asked your questions, um, as well as to all our speakers for providing some really great answers uh, to fill in the gaps for everyone. So with consideration of time, if you did have a question that we either didn't answer or that you just didn't feel comfortable posting, please do reach out to the speakers uh, or myself or your local RNAO representative, and we will try our very best to get you the answer. So with that, just a couple of closing remarks to close off our forum. Thank you all so much for joining. We hope this gave you an opportunity to ask some questions and learn a little bit more about the opioid crisis, current efforts that are in place across a diverse range of organizations, um, as well as the current strategy and pillars uh, and what, what work's being done in all of those areas. So thank you, thank you, thank you to our six speakers. Uh, we're extremely grateful for your time and for, you sh for sharing your expertise and all of your information. Um, just so that you're, you know, we are gonna provide each of you with a $100 honorarium that we hope can be donated to efforts or programs within your organization to address the opioid crisis, mental health and addictions um, for all your hard work and time spent. We really do appreciate it. And on behalf of Region 11, our chapters and our speakers, thank you to all of those that participated uh, and re-registered for tonight's session to really gain more information, as I mentioned. And we apologize for going slightly over time, but we hope that was valuable for you in getting those questions answered. So thanks again to everyone for joining us and to all of the chapters that helped put this together. We hope you have a great evening and hopefully we'll see you again for another forum on another hot topic. So thank, thank you and good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye.